Hello, everyone. Happy Friday. It is an awesome day here, uh, here in Ohio. It's beautiful. And I hope everyone uh, is having a good week. I hope everyone has a great upcoming weekend here. We've got a lot of questions. Um, but as usual, uh, if you want more detailed responses and be part of a big community, uh, we have the Jim Wendler uh, Forum. It is a private forum. Forum. It's a. I think it's uh, five dollars a month. Uh, there's a. It's built up in the last. I don't know. Maybe 15 years or so into an awesome community of people. There's no politics. Uh, there's no. Uh, everyone's got to post with their real name. So uh, unless you're like a in a position where that would be bad, like a. We've had a couple first responder guys who uh, have to kind of stay secret. But anyway. Uh, JimWeather.com forum, and we're going to go ahead and get right to these questions. Uh, we have a ton, so and I looked over a couple of them real quick before we started. So we're going to go ahead and start with. <clears throat> I think I got this right. Cancer ass kicker. He writes, "Where can I buy the training program that your wife, my wife, does with the junior high kids? Uh, we don't have one for sale, mostly because it's not really a program." Uh, so basically what she does, she has a basic uh, calisthenic style warm-up, um, which is previewed in the youth training video that I did, which very much like that. So um, some kind of lower body, upper body push, upper body pull done as a circuit. Uh, and then they do one main lift a day. And that usually is the squat, the barbell squat, the barbell bench press or the trap bar. And then she ends with some kind of assistance work uh, for the upper and lower body. So it's very, very basic. The loading is very conservative. Um, so it's not terribly complicated. So again, calisthenic style warm up for maybe five to 10 minutes. And that's usually done every minute on the minute. So for example, uh, yesterday, I think they did 10 squats and they get to choose their push-ups and chin-ups, but I think James did like five push-ups and one chin-up every minute on the minute for 10 minutes, and then they bench pressed. And then uh, he did, uh, I don't know, jumps maybe and rows and curls or something, I don't know. So, but that's the basic thing, but no, we don't sell that, uh, any program like that. So I am sorry, uh, but I would use that basic template one main, Warm up, one main lift a day, two to three assistance work, sets of uh, exercise of assistance, uh, and start light and progress slow. Uh, and then on the off days, I would do you know some kind of easy conditioning to start with, whether that be walking, riding the bike, stuff like that. Uh, and you could always throw in something hard, uh, like the prowler or something similar. Uh, but I would do those on the off days. So I try to train, lift weights three times a week, walk or, you know, do something like that three or four times a week. So, all right. Taylor Ham says, hey, Jim, what made you decide to change the assistance work, I guess, is what he's asking for the push-pull single leg core as opposed to upper and lower split for assistance? Uh, well, the big reason why I kind of had a change was the uh, – from working, you know, for years and years, I was training with, and myself, I was fairly advanced, but I worked with and trained with a lot of highly skilled lifters. And then when I went to the regular people, I forgot, <clears throat> it's there's a big difference between having an advanced lifter, not an advanced athlete, but an advanced lifter and a beginner or, uh, you know, somewhere around there lifter. And uh, that's why I changed because the the majority of people fall into the beginner style category and they can handle a little extra volume on that stuff. So again, it's, it was a real uh, eye opener when I started working with, I would hate to say normal people, but just, you know, not guys who all bench press 600 pounds and squat 900 pounds. And uh, you know, you, you kind of forget uh, how the regular world is when you're just surrounded by that. I always liken it to growing up in the Chicago area uh, you know, for 18 years, I thought there was great pizza places on every single corner and every single block. And then you move to Tucson, Arizona to go to school and there's not a single good pizza place in the entire state. So 
uh, it gets your, your reality gets skewed a little bit. So that's the big reason why. All right. Chris Homer says, Hey, uh, any experience or advice on dealing with plantar fasciitis? Uh, no, I have zero. I know my mom had it and I don't know really what she did. Um, so, and I know, but it's, it's a horrible, it could be very debilitating. So I do not have any experience or advice on that. Um, but the only thing I will tell you is train what you can train, train what is trainable and you need to these the rest or rehab. And sometimes those two things, uh, sometimes just doing nothing will be your rehab. Trust me, I've been there, not with the plantar fasciitis, but other issues. So, uh, and I'm always the kind of guy, I'm sure many of you guys know this, I will rehab my body, you know, 18 hours every day if I had to. And I <clears throat> sometimes though, that's not the answer. Sometimes you just don't do anything. And sometimes that's what the healing that you need. So be careful. Uh, you know, if I find an exercise or, you know, a stretch or something that seems to help, you know, whatever I have, I'm the kind of person that will just do that all day and figure out, think that, well, if five, you know, minutes is good, then eight hours is better. And sometimes it doesn't always equate. Sometimes it does, but most of the time it does not. So just remember that, Chris, but I, I'm sorry, I don't have much experience. You know, I always say I may have went to school for a long time, but I don't have a doctorate. I'm not a medical <laughs> experts so but good luck man and remember train what is trainable so for example if all you can do is bench press and chin ups and rows or something be the king of that stuff man and uh all right here we go alex says hey you've talked before about the lead fts power squat being great for your leg strength and it's what i what i call a dumb dumb exercise uh what would you have a garage equivalent to maybe Hatfield squats. Uh, doo -doo -doo -doo. It's it's tough, um, but I think that's probably a pretty good. Uh, I had not thought about that, Alex. But I think that would be a good thing as long as you can you got something to hold on to, um, like the true Hatfield squat. Um, you know, the other thing is uh, it's not the same basic thing, but just regular safety squat bar stuff or if you have like a hundred pound weight vest just doing a million reps uh squat reps with that um doing uh weighted lunges not super heavy if, especially if you got a weight vest that would be good walking up and down stairs with a weight vest or a hill uh, anything just to strengthen your legs but uh it's just not the same uh so i think alex the hatfield squat you know with the safety squat bar and the handles i think that's a great a great idea and i had not thought about that alex then goes and asks uh i'd also be interested to hear how the power squat fit into the rest of your week was it done after squatting thank you okay so when i did the power squat uh i would do that on monday and so my monday would always be the power squat machine uh, 45 de degree back raises done with a barbell you know on my well I guess technically on my back, but I held it on my neck and I do a ton of weighted ab work. Those three exercises I did every Monday for like two years. Yeah, I did a ton of work on the power squat. Uh, and my power squat workout lasted probably way too long. And, you know, at that time I had a pretty good lifting crew. So we would just start really light and just start doing sets of 10. Uh, I think we've done something like 40 or 50 sets of 10, which is ridiculous. And they're not very heavy, if I'm going to be honest, but we just keep on adding one plate here, one plate here, and just do sets of 10 until basically where legs felt like jello. Uh, and then sometimes we work up pretty heavy. But most of the time, uh, we just have a good time with it and fun with it. And it wasn't really a, good, a big plan. I didn't really have a plan going in every day. We just had some fun. Um, but uh, that was always done on Monday. And then on Friday, we would, I'd squat and do some uh, deadlift stuff. And that's maybe a little ab work on Friday. So that's how it was done. Uh, RNC says, hey, I've worked my way up to three sets of six on pull-ups and then two more sets of five in this rep range. Am I better off using the assisted machine or do I keep plugging away with normal pull-ups? I don't see any reason for you to use the assisted machine. I would just shoot for a total amount of reps per day. So 
Uh, so you're doing 18, so you're doing 28 total reps. I usually try to shoot for a rep count, a total rep count uh, per workout. So you're doing 28, you could easily probably get up to 35 or 50 and break that down into smaller sets uh, or smaller uh, reps. So instead of doing three sets of six, you could probably do, uh, I don't know, 20 sets of two throughout the workout or 25 sets of two and work through there. So I never really worried about <clears throat> the reps per set. I just worried about the total amount of volume that I did on that day. So that's what I would do. Um, I'm not, don't, didn't never really did much chin ups like to failure, you know, like, like a normal, like you do a normal uh, dumbbell bench or any kind of assistance work or anything like that. So now you're free to do that if, 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 if you feel like it's uh, helped you out. But what's always worked for me would be to do a total daily volume or training volume for that day and then just keep on doing sets of pull-ups between everything that I did that day. So if I'm squatting, I'm still doing pull-ups, you know, in between squat sets. If I'm benching, same thing, deadlifts, all that other stuff. So, And then you just continue doing the pull-ups throughout the entire workout. So through your assistance work and everything else. Uh, so that's what I would do, and that's what I did. And that's, you know, I still do a ton of pull-ups today and chin-ups. So uh, the only thing is just make sure you're trying to uh, change your grips. Uh, don't get stuck just doing one grip all the time. So uh, we obviously you can use a parallel grip or a uh, neutral grip. You know, the what's this pull-ups, chin-ups, and then I would use implements if you can get your hands on uh, a rope. Uh, or if not, you can always hang towels. That's what we did in college. Uh, so you just drape it kind of a thin hand towel and you drape it over so two ends meet and you just grab it and do pull-ups and there's all kinds of cool stuff you can do pull-ups on so um, the more grips that you use and the, uh, the better <clears throat> the more varied you are the better you're going to be in the long run so all right here we go uh rnc has another question he, he asks do you have a preference between the original 531 for beginners or the beginner prep school? I do not. Um, you know, the most important thing for beginners to do is to have introduced them to the lifts, make sure the loading is correct on the lifts so they're able to perform the lifts correctly and to perform assistance exercises and stuff that help build muscle, uh, help uh, have a wide variety of movements that they uh, can get used to. And, uh, Obviously, you're going to build some strength in there, and that's going to obviously help uh, the main lifts and just overall GPP. So I don't have a preference, and you can't go wrong with really anything as long as you follow those the basic principles of the program and making sure that the loading isn't super aggressive. I'm not a big fan of uh, just trying to add more weight and more weight and more weight. Like I don't chase numbers. I chase performance. And along the way, if you do things correctly, you are going to get stronger. You are going to get bigger and you're going to do so in a safe manner. And uh, what I have found out is the slower that we go, the stronger that the kids get and the longer lasting uh, their strength gains. And uh, so they're not going to go up, hit a peak and then just hit a, hit a plateau. Uh, and this goes along, <clears throat> really has to do with building their I call it GPP, but their general fitness base, um, and that includes muscle mass, that includes strength, that includes conditioning, mobility, flexibility, jumping, speed, conditioning, all that stuff. So we try to raise all that stuff up. Again, this is what is known as concurrent, or what a lot of you guys know as conjugate style training. We try to raise all the abilities basically at once, and it can be done in a very uh, inexperienced lifter or beginner. So I would... Uh, highly recommend that if you are training yourself, like if you consider yourself a beginner, uh, that you're trying to raise multiple things at once. You don't have to do a ton to do that. Uh, if you're, for example, if you're in really poor conditioning shape, you don't need to do, you know, three a days to get in good shape. You know, every other day, you know, between your lifting days, maybe you go ride the bike for 30 minutes or go walk for three to four or five miles or something like that it will raise up and you you don't have to like pound yourself into the ground. So remember that, all right? Don't just try to get stronger, try to do a lot of other stuff because you can get away with a lot of that stuff, all right? And again, 
you know, the one thing is we talk about balance in your training. Balance doesn't mean equal time. So, for example, most people will spend more time strength training. Maybe they, they like it more and it does require a little more time. But if you still want to be mobile and flexible, you don't need to spend an hour a day doing that just like you do your lifting. It may only take you 10 or 15 minutes. Uh, but it's important that you attack all those things um, and have some kind of balance in your training because it will catch up to you at some point. Trust me. Uh, if I, every guy that I know, uh, every single like big time lifter I used to train with, or I know personally, they all say the same thing. I wish I would have spent 20 minutes a day doing this or done this three times a week. It would have helped uh, their health and it would have helped their longevity in the, in the uh, gym and make them just feel overall better. So remember that, especially you young lifters. That doesn't mean you don't go bananas and try to do crazy stuff. It just have a little bit of balance in your training. All right. In other words, have an apple every once in a while. It's not going to kill you. All right. Uh, here's a question. Would you consider kettlebells more of a conditioning tool than a strength tool? Well, I guess it depends on how you use them, right? Because technically a barbell could be used as a conditioning tool if you're doing uh, like the Javorsic circuits. I believe that's what they're called. And, you know, obviously if you use a very light weight and perform things in a circuit style fashion, the barbell can also be used as a strength tool, a hypertrophy tool, and it can be also done as a, like I said, a conditioning tool. So, um, and it, the, it also depends on who's using them. If my mom is using a kettlebell to do kettlebell squats or something like that, it might be more of a strength tool uh, because she's not terribly strong. Now, if some guy who's deadlifting 800 pounds, uh, it's not going to be really a strength tool uh, per se. So um, it just depends on how you use them and what the person, uh, who the person is uh, using them, right? And where they are in their fitness uh, journey, so to speak. So um, yeah, different, you know, the tool can be used for a lot of different things. You know, a hammer can be used to hit a nail and can be used to, you know, defend your home, I guess. <laughs> so Although I don't know, I wouldn't use a hammer uh, as a, as a self-defense tool unless you had to. So, all right, here we go. Jeremy. Oh, boy. He writes or asks, types, if you needed to lose 100 pounds, what are the first five habits, habits you would incorporate? All right, so if I needed to lose 100 pounds, uh, the first thing I would do, this wouldn't be one of the habits, but the first thing I would do is I would look at it like this. How long did it take me to get gain this 100 pounds? <clears throat> and I would say, listen, I'm going to use that same amount of time period to lose the 100 pounds. So um, it usually will take much shorter than that, but I wouldn't try to crash diet or try to get all the 100 pounds off as quickly as possible. Now, in a perfect world, uh, you'd be able to do that, but the problem is a lot of times those who – lose all that weight very quickly, do so, and then they just gain it right back. So uh, that would be the first thing is have patience, you know, look at it as like a, a four-year plan to start off with and then work from there. So the five, first five, ha or the five habits. Uh, okay, this is easy. Not easy. Uh, number one is I would strength train three times a week and I, it would combine strength and hypertrophy work. So uh, you don't have to go bananas and I would do movements that you can do. Uh, so it doesn't have to be, you know, what everyone's telling you to do. So for example, if you cannot deadlift for whatever reason, um, I wouldn't deadlift. I would do something other than that. Uh, if you can't overhead press, for example, then you just stick with the bench press. So I would incorporate movements and, and exercises that you can do. And then eventually you may be able to, do the deadlifts or do the squats or whatever you can't do. So number one, strength train three times a week. Uh, number two is I would have a non-negotiable diet, meaning I'd have a basic diet plan, whether that means counting calories or following a specific protocol per meal or anything like that, whatever works for you, non-negotiable. Um, in fact, all this stuff would be non-negotiable. And uh, so, but then a diet would be very, and I'd make it as simple as possible. So um, <clears throat> something that is pretty black and white on what you eat. Um, and I would be incredibly strict with that. 
you know, because that's going to be the big thing is both the movement and the diet are going to be big. So again, I wouldn't be, uh, remember you want to get stronger. You want to put on muscle because that will make you lose the weight quicker. And you, I'd follow a non-negotiable, very simple diet, something that you know you can handle. Um, and it's kind of black and white. So number three, I would probably, uh, find a, some kind of easy conditioning thing that you can do. And I would, if you can do like multiple things, I would do that, but I would do those on the off days. So for example, it might be walking on the treadmill, might be riding a bike, might be walking outside. So on the days you aren't lifting, I would commit to, you know, whatever you can handle first. So it might be 20 minutes, might be 30 minutes, might be 10 minutes, whatever, non-negotiable on the off days, you're doing that. And uh, so it could be as simple as, and again, you might be able to use uh, the bike, you might be able to use the treadmill. So just change things up whenever you feel like it and uh, go for it. But you got to incorporate some basic movement uh, every day. Uh, so that's three. number four, I guess, would be sleep and following a fairly hardcore schedule. And I don't mean like hardcore, like you're joining the Navy SEALs or anything. But you wake up every day at a certain time, you lift at a certain time, eat at a certain time. Uh, so be very uh, strict on the sleep that you get. You know, obviously you want to get good sleep. And, uh, but have a schedule every day that uh, allows you to have time to do all these things so you're not overwhelmed. Okay. Uh, so, for example, every day you would wake up. I'm just making it, you know, 6 a.m. you wake up. Uh, every day you have an hour of training, whether that be the walking or the bike or the lifting. So every day you have an hour devoted to that. You're in bed at a certain time, stuff like that. So, uh, and I'd make it as strict as you possibly can. Okay. Uh, and the final thing, I guess I would do something for your brain. And so the easiest and simplest thing would be to read, uh, you know, have, Give yourself, I don't know, 10 minutes or something uh, every day or whatever uh, time period that you have within your schedule. I would schedule something for your brain. Uh, and again, I'm not, I don't think you need to read uh, motivational books unless you want to. I don't think you need to read diet books or anything like that. I just think you need to read a book that you enjoy. Uh, I think it's super important that people still read. And I would really recommend reading a book. Uh, not listening to a book on tape. I think there's something to sitting down and looking at a piece of paper and reading those, those words and forming those images in your head and, you know, letting that movie, you know, you're the own director basically uh, of how that book is going to look in your head. So I think that's super important. And I think as most people know that the mind and the body need to work together so those five things, again, I think it's lifting, some kind of conditioning, a non-negotiable diet. Oh, boy. Uh, having a schedule, sleep, and having a strict schedule that you stick to and something for your brain. So, But, uh, Jeremy, good luck, man. And don't be overwhelmed one pound at a time. One pound at a time. I always tell the kids, all we're looking for is one more rep or five more pounds. That's it. We're not looking for a... 30 pound gain in the bench press, we're looking for a one pound gain or one rep gain. So take it slow, be consistent. It's, you know, I always say consistency is a superpower and be persistent because if you just keep on hitting that rock over and over again, the boulder that you're trying to break may look overwhelming. And eventually you're going to hit it with an ax and it's going to fall apart. And everyone says, oh, look at that last hit. It exploded. And you say, dude, it wasn't the last hit that caused it to explode. It was a 5,000 other hits that you didn't show up for and didn't see that really made that thing break. So that's my best advice, Jeremy. Good luck. Um, and always have that within that schedule. I can't uh, stress this enough. You know, it's great to have goals to lose 100 pounds, but have action goals that will get you to lose 100 pounds. Okay. So again, action goals rule the world. Okay. Uh, another question, uh, would doing rows the day after pull-ups negatively impact recovery? Uh, probably not. You'll probably be okay. Um, again, it depends on who's doing that. 
the volume and all that other stuff. Uh, but for the most part, uh, you can probably do uh, back exercises a little more frequently than, than most people uh, for other exercises can do. So I think you'd be okay. Uh, Rennell says, uh, can't join today, Jim, but thank you again for your support in industry. Well, I appreciate that, Rennell. Thank you uh, for at least stopping by and leaving a message. I love doing these, and I'm glad. Uh, hopefully, you can watch this you know, on your own time. Okay. Uh, Albinson says, hello, Jim. How hard can I push my assistance on my anchor cycle? I'm doing FSL five sets of five. Uh, so generally, you're probably pushing your PR sets on that. Um, you can still push your assistance work, but I would probably lay off the volume a little bit if you're pushing the sets harder, or you can do more volume and you can kind of keep what I would call, well, what bodybuilders call the intensity down a little bit. So you should be all right. You should be okay. Uh, by still pushing assistance, but just don't spend, you know, two hours doing uh, all assistance work. So uh, I'd rather see you do it harder and do it in a shorter amount of time and really work than just spend all day, you know, doing tricep pushdowns and whatever the hell else people do for assistance work. So I still think you can push it, man. And if you start to feel a little run down or tired, that's why when we, <clears throat> when I tell you guys how to program stuff, sometimes, uh, you choose just easier exercises on the days that you need to. And when you feel good, man, let's go ahead and let it rip. You'll be okay. Okay. Do, 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 do. Uh, Josh says, Hey Jim, I recently got asked to join the high school football coaching staff. Well, that's great. Josh, the head coach is getting ready to change the weightlifting program. I have told him about your program. If you have time, you, could you send a something program, mock program? Oh, mock as an M-O-C-K, not the speed of sound, of what you do with the kids in London, like what days you lift and what main lifts you are doing and accessories. Uh, well, Josh, I will give you a brief overview, but I put this all up on the private, private forum. Every single day we train, I list everything that we do, but here's the basic thing. Our main lifts, we always do one main lift a day. Our main lift is either the squat, the bench press, or the trap bar. So we always do one main lift a day, okay? Uh, we always do some kind of jumping or um, like gymnastic style work. I, I hate to use that term, but, you know, basic crab walks, uh, forward rolls, cartwheels, stuff like that. We always do something like that per day. And a lot of jumping, so that could be long jumps, box jumps, bounding, depth jumps, all that other stuff. So every day we're doing something like that. And then every day we do some kind of assistance work. And that's usually two to three lifts uh, that I choose. Um, they, you know, I don't know what your weight room has access to or how, what you feel comfortable coaching, but generally we do some kind of upper body push, some kind of upper body pull and something for our lower bodies. And, uh, you know, obviously things change based on the readiness and what we're doing that day for running. Uh, and then I should probably say we also run every day. Um, so that's the basic, it's really simple guys. Uh, if you saw what we do, and again, I'm very transparent with that on the forum. Um, you know, I list every day we have our own in the training log section. I have the London football team and you can see everything we've done since basically, I don't know, maybe 2021 or something, every workout's listed. So, and that includes all the in-season work. So it's very simple. Uh, it's not balls to the wall training all the time. Um, but we're very consistent. We train year round. Uh, we train obviously through the season, obviously that's in season training. Um, and, uh, so today is Friday. So today, uh, we're lifting and we also have the prowler. So good times. So Josh, that's the basic overview, but if you want a more complete overview that the, the private forum, uh, has it all listed out, it's really easy. And speaking of the forum, John Donovan, who has been on there for a while, makes a comment says the private forum is outstanding uh so thank you john but josh that's your probably your best resource but be prepared to be un underwhelmed a little bit because it's not about always about what you do it's about how you do it and i'm very strict on what i expect from the kids and the effort and the attitude that they display in the weight room i'm also very strict about how it's done 
Uh, I am not a form Nazi, but there are certain things that are non-negotiable for me. And uh, the kids know that. And the, the higher the standards, guys, the more the kids will reach them. Uh, the lower the standards, the worst effort and everything else you'll get. So, uh, okay, heavyweights. Oh, Vincent, good morning, handsome. Good, <laughs> My good friend, Vincent Desenzo. How you doing, buddy? Oh, it's your last year, I believe, of uh, work. So Vincent will be retiring. And he's a very young man. Uh, and he's going to have an awesome retirement. I hope, I hope he gets to stop by more often and just hang out, uh, you know, during the year. So, Vincent, you're always welcome in the uh, Casa de Muerte, as I like to call my house. All right. So Heavyweight says, uh, greetings. When you started slowing down on progress for the overhead press, what did you do to get over the hump? I haven't missed a rep yet, but the top sets are getting harder. So, that, you know, my overhead press made a lot of progress when I really started committing to it. And then, as everyone knows, it just took, it just kind of plateaued. So what I did was I just kept the same three basic training maxes. And I just, you know, I don't remember what they were, but I would just repeat those same three. And then I would do joker sets or rep, you know, rep joker sets on days I felt good. And with the exercises, with the uh, main lift, I'd always strive for better completion of every rep. So every rep was cleaner and better. So even though I wasn't setting rep PRs, I was really working on the bar speed. I was really working on technique and all that other stuff. So that's number one. Number two, again, uh, when I felt good, I would, you know, so if my last set was at 235, uh, I would then, if I felt good, I would maybe do 260 and see if I can do a triple there. Uh, so I kept, on those days I felt good, I kept, you know, rep records for all that other stuff. So sometimes you get them, sometimes you don't. Uh, the other thing that I did was I really started pushing the assistance work that I felt helped me, which was mainly dips and rows. And uh, I should have done probably more bicep work, if I'm going to be honest. Um, and obviously you, you want to keep the upper back working. I was already doing that. So, um, and then obviously, uh, I was still doing a ton of ab work. So, and so basically it wasn't about increasing my training max. It was about increasing the quality of each and every rep that I did and really working on the technique and explosiveness of each rep. Um, uh, and then doing joker rep sets, uh, when I felt, it was good, but that's really hard to figure out. Like you can't program that stuff. That's advanced shit. And uh, that's why you can't really write advanced programs for people. So that's what I would do. Um, and that's what I did. So and I did really well with that. That's when I really started. Uh, that's when I pressed 300 pounds uh, over my head and I just missed like 315 right here. I I just wasn't strong enough to hit 315. I, I think I have a video of that somewhere, or I did. And I'm so mad because I think I did 285 for a triple. And I was like, oh, man. And uh, I think if I would have just done 285 for a single and then did uh, the 315, I probably would have gotten that. But I wasn't really planning on it. Anyway, that's what I would recommend. Uh... Justin says, hey, Jim, what is your opinion on doing 531 three times per week, okay, with one lower body session alternating the squats and deads each week? Can you still get strong with only one lower body session per week? The answer is yes, you can. And there's a couple things that you need to do is, one, you need to uh, – believe that it can work because I think a lot of people start psyching themselves out if they're, if I'm not doing this and not doing that. And I get it, man, I've been there and I still kind of have to mentally get myself in the right uh, mindset for certain things. So that's number one is believe in what you're doing. Uh, number two is make sure that the loading is correct. Uh, I say that all the time. Uh, and don't freak out if you have a bad workout on one of those days, it'll happen. So, you know, if you have a bad squat day, that doesn't mean you have to change all your training. It just means you had a bad squat day. Now, if it persists for a while, then you may have to change. The other thing I would probably do is on the Mondays and Fridays, I would include some kind of lower body exercise. So, for example, if you squat on Wednesday, on Friday, you would do some kind of lower body 
uh, like straight leg deadlifts or good mornings or something kind of deadlifty, so to speak, on Friday. And the days that you deadlift on Wednesday, on Friday, you could do some kind of lower body leg exercise. Uh, and that could be, you know, leg press, power squat, dumbbell squat, lunges, something like that. So you're still doing some lower body stuff. Um, so that's what I would recommend. And make sure you keep up with your abdominal work and with your lower back work on uh, on your sit on your uh, Monday, Wednesday, and Friday too. It only takes a couple sets to maintain or to gain. So that's what I would uh, recommend. And just so everyone knows, that's how that's the basic kind of setup that Joe DeFranco used. Uh, and still, I think he still uses to that day, at least for some of his guys, and it's worked out very well, uh, very well for those guys. Uh, Julian Lai says, can a beginner run the five through one program or they, or must they start with something like starting strength? Uh, starting strength is probably a little bit better in that it gives you a plan. I think you, we run five through one with beginners all the time, but we always have an introductory period. Obviously we have to teach them how to lift. You can't just throw a kid in there and expect them to work up and figure out a training max. So we always, and that's what my wife does with a lot of the kids. And obviously if a kid comes to me uh, who doesn't train with the junior high kids, we have to start them with that. And that's just, you know, we just train him and get him introduced to the lifts. And, uh, but that, I don't really have a plan for that. I just watch the kid every time he does something and I tell him to go up, stay the same, etc. So there's not really a plan with that. So I think for, so if you don't have a good coach that can kind of show you what you're doing, Julian, I would probably just start with starting strength uh, because it gives you a solid black and white plan. If you're working with a coach that knows how to work uh, with a beginner and how to build his general fitness base and strength base, uh, then I would obviously I'd much rather have you work with someone who knows what they're doing. In fact, that you know, for anyone, if you can work with a coach, they're going to be a lot better off than if, if you have to do it on your own. So there you go. So can they? Yes. Uh, but you have to kind of know what you're doing. And again, if you have a coach, you'd be fine. If not uh, stick with starting strength. There you go. Eddie field says is football strength training are you guys providing any nutrition calories for your players on a regular basis or do you rely on the athletes families to keep players well fed? Uh, well, our, the moms do dinners, uh, during the season. Uh, I know, uh, the head coach has like some, uh, you know, like protein bars and some shakes and stuff, but that's very, you know, we don't have a ton of money. So yes, most of the time we're, we're relying on families, and generally speaking, we, the kids that don't maybe can't get the calories for whatever reason, uh, they're usually taken in by our fam by families. And, uh, that's just the way it is when you live in a small town, I'm sure a lot of you guys know that. So a lot of kids, uh, will bunk up with another family for a while. It doesn't mean they sleep there. It just means that they're going to eat there and they get their lunches and stuff. And all, you know, uh, the families provide for the kids that don't have the financial means to do so. So. But as a program, yes, we do have uh, dinners uh, during the football season, and uh, our because we live in a small community, uh, we have a lot of families that help other families out. So uh, that's just the way it goes. That's why it's good to live in a small town because they take care of each other. I love it. Uh, Harry Callahan. <laughs> I assume that's not your real name, Harry. He asks, what do you think about floor press like main lift or for a main lift? I guess you're asking in a trap bar. I think they're great. If you want to do floor press as a main lift, I think that's awesome. And obviously we use the trap bar as a main lift. So you're good to go, brother. Okay. Vincent, my man. So this is Vincent Desenzo. Everyone who's, uh, makes a comment here. Um, Vincent has benched 900 pounds and he's benched 600 pounds raw. And I think one, two, three, four different weight classes, maybe, or three different weight classes. Um, so he writes, I have been having great success with the percentage work that you based off of Prilipin's chart. So I did a five through one slash Prilipin kind of breakdown on the forum. I don't know, maybe a couple months ago. 
Uh, and this is what Vincent is referring to. So uh, he then writes, I find it's better for me to auto-regulate at my age. You're correct. So within this five through one prolipin thing, you have a, <clears throat> you have an, a chance to auto-regulate uh, and change. And then he asked, is there any chance of you putting it out in a new book? Um, I might do that at some point. I don't know. Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I would probably put that in a new book. Um, and what's crazy is I came up with this idea probably 12 years ago, and I just kind of worked it out in my head. I didn't really spend too much time on it, but yeah, I kind of came up with the idea. And then I recently put it on the forum probably two or three years ago, and then I revisited it uh, recently, and Vincent's been using this. Uh, it's really good for older advanced lifters. So uh, if you're part of the forum, you know exactly what I'm talking about. So. But yeah, I'd probably put that in a new book if, if it's going to be a pure lifting book. So yes. Uh, Julian says, after doing the main lift and the first set last, I feel very tired. Should I still do assistance, assistance training or should I end the training? Well, you're going to have, this is part of training, man. Uh, you're going to have to kind of figure out uh, what you can do and how high you can push if I were you. I would do assistance work between the main lift and assistance work between your FSL stuff. And that way you're good to go and you're not wasting time. So for example, if you are bench pressing between your main lift, you would do your uh, upper body pull. So for example, between the, when you're doing your main lift, you're doing all your dumbbell rows in between your first set last stuff, you're doing your uh, single leg or core lift. So you're alternating supersetting, and that way you get everything done. Uh, you will definitely increase your fitness levels and you don't have to spend any more time in the weight room. So that's what I would probably do. But the real question is, should I end the training? Man, it's hard to know. And this is where experience comes in. This is why you keep a training log because sometimes there's days I've been there where I knew exactly how I was feeling and I was so tired that I knew I couldn't do anything else. And then you leave. Other days you learn like, listen, I know how I feel, but I know I can push through. Again, this is based on experience. And uh, so this is why you train, man. Uh, I can give you some advice like I just did, but uh, sometimes you got to jump off that cliff and realize it was not a good idea. And sometimes you got to push a little bit and realize it's going to be a good thing. So uh, again, uh, hard for me to say. Uh, doo -doo 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 -doo. Tyler says, hey, happy Friday. Well, happy Friday. He goes on and says, I'm 32 years old and started lifting in my late 20s. Thank you for promoting a long-term approach to training. Okay. Well, you're very welcome. I feel better physically and mentally since switching to five throw and learning from you. Well, thank you, Tyler. Uh, he goes on and says, I hope I can run into you at the Arnold to thank you in person. Well, that's awesome. I don't think I'm going to the Arnold this year. I think we uh, kind of put a kibosh on that early on. So, but Tyler, if I ever meet you or if you ever see me, feel free to uh, introduce yourself. I was just out at lunch the other day in Columbus and ran into some people and it was great meeting them. So uh, yeah, if you see me and know me, that's awesome. Paul G says, hey Jim, what are your top five favorite bands or bands you are currently listening to? Oh man. Probably Mayhem, Neurosis. I'm probably going to forget a lot of these things. Probably I Hate God. Uh, geez, Louise. I mean, I got a ton of bands I love. I'm sure I'm going to miss out a lot of these. So, yeah, I'd probably just stick with those right now. Electric Wizard obviously was a big part. Uh, Celtic Frost was a huge part of my life. Slayer. Um I love Portal. I can't always handle Portal, but I love Portal. Love them. Uh, seeing Neurosis live was absolutely amazing. It's a shame that they are no longer playing live, but if you could see them back in the day, man, it was unbelievable. So, uh, But I'd say right now, uh, <clears throat> Neurosis and Mayhem always seem to find its way into my ears. So, And I got the new Marduk, uh, Memento Mori, I think, the new Marduk album. And I'm not loving it as much as I thought I would. Still, you know, I have to listen to it about 100 times. So, um, all right, here we go. We got to get moving here, people. 
Uh, Big Wad says, after my 531 sessions, I have minimal soreness, but I really pushed my Walrus sessions this week, and I am feeling it today. Would you suggest scaling back, or is this soreness expected? It's going to be expected. Uh, so your body will adapt eventually. What you really need to do is under see how you feel before you train. Uh, there's a difference between being sore and tired and just being run down. So I think right now you're going to be uh, – the soreness is expected. So, uh, but let, let your body adapt and then go from there. Good job, man. All right. Eric says last week, someone asked about a light brief for squat support. I've been using the Inzer power pants. Okay. Since tearing in my hip and groin, no recurrent issues since I started wearing them. So there you go. It's called the Inzer power pants. Whew. Probably could have used those when I was in high school. All right. Not for training. If a lifter has very limited time, which assistance would be okay to admit? Or should a lifter make them all some sort of priority? So if I had very limited time, I would always put in some pulling work and some kind of core work. So abdominal or lower back hamstring work and some kind of pull uh, pull-ups, chin-ups, lat pull-downs, some kind of rowing, stuff like that. So if I had to admit it, that's what I would do. So, uh, okay. <laughs> okay, I'm not going to repeat that heavyweight. All right, here we go. Uh, hey, Jim, today is my 35th birthday. Well, happy birthday. Ten years ago, I found your work. Because of you, I've become a better father. That's awesome, husband, and a better person. I lost my dad at 20. In a way, you have filled that gap. Well, that's awesome, Jesse. I, uh, that is a huge uh, statement to make, and I hope I'm doing a good job. Listen, I'm not uh, I'm not perfect, so just understand that I'm just a regular human being who Constantly messes up. Oh my God, do I mess up? It's very uh, humbling all the time. So, but I'm glad at least I try to do the best I can to to be a good person. It may not, you know, a lot of people don't think that, but I do. Um, and as a father and a coach, I take that stuff very seriously. Obviously, probably a little rough around the edges for some people, but at the end of the day, I do care. Uh, Robert says. I, uh, he said he joined the forum and it's information dense and offers perspective from people who have had similar problems and issues to mine. Robert says he is 63 years old and he has plenty. His reading suggestion is Tarnsman of Gore by John Norman. Ah, there you go. That's an interesting name for a book. Tarnsman of Gore. And that's Gore, G-O-R, not G-O-R-E. So it's probably not a death metal book. All right, here we go. Hey, Jim, for your kids, when you teach bench, do you have them do a pause on the chest before exploding up? Does the pause on the chest have any benefit outside of cue for powerlifting? We do not have them pause on their chest. And the pause does have a benefit just from uh, they will generally lower the bar a little slower. Um and obviously they're not going to bounce off their chest. So yes, it does have a benefit. If that does become a problem, then we would ask the kids to slow down and, and have a slight pause, but we've never really had that issue, believe it or not. So, um, but we do not teach that. We just teach touch and go. Um, listen, when you're teaching kids, you can't put a lot of things on the table when you teach anyone uh, new how to lift. So um, I try to limit the, coaching cues so as long as they're bringing it down because we've had kids do some interesting bench presses <laughs> since i've been there so um all right john donovan says do you prefer bands or cables for face pulls uh i probably prefer a cable but i'll just use whatever's handy so i'm not terribly uh don't really care about that if i'm going to be honest so cables uh if i would prefer that yes all right, Jesse says, for my birthday, I'm going to smash, smash the gas. I have a deadlift party and squat party. My goal is to do 335 pounds on the deadlift for many sets and super set that with 225 until my form fails. And then a two-mile walk with a weight vest. Your thoughts? Jesse, my thoughts are that's incredibly dumb. 
but go for it because you always got to do some dumb shit every once in a while. And I'm a huge fan of limited dumb stuff because not everything can I always like to say about 90 to 95% of your training should be smart and calculated and have some brains behind it. And then the rest of the time you got to do some dumb stuff because you need to test your brain and your body somehow. And since most of us aren't playing a sport or really have to use our physical stuff in our daily life or jobs, I still think you need to do some, some kind of dumb stuff, whether that be weekly or well, whether that be every three months or something like that depends on how dumb it is. Um, and uh, I still think that's super important. So good luck, Jesse. Enjoy uh, and be ready to be sore tomorrow, man. And enjoy that two mile walk with the weight vest. <laughs> God, that's a horrible idea. Woo. All right. And that means it's good. Uh, hey, Jim, here's another question. Do you prefer to deload every fourth week or seventh week nowadays? Uh, it depends on the lifter. depends on the program. There's a lot of things going on there. Uh, we, how we do our deloads at the schools, we are doing something usually uh, at least every seventh week, but we will throw in a deload whenever we need it. So I, if a training day comes about and I walk into the weight room, you can usually tell right when you get there and you know it's going to be a stinker. Uh, you, de you just put in a very deload style workout right there. Obviously during the season of training or season, the football season, you have to be very ready to do that quite a bit. Uh, so you just have to be very smart. So uh, you can't really say that I prefer one or the other, if I'm going to be honest, because if there's so many variables within there, not every person uh, has the same stressors in their everyday life. So it's hard to say. It's hard to say. So, um, and again, uh, just do what you need to do and be smart about it. So, uh, Heavyweight says, thank you so much for the solid advice about the overhead press. Uh, we are very welcome. Hey, Jim, any tips on working around an injury? My hand oof, was crushed pretty bad. It should heal up all right, but leaves me single-handed for a few months. I've just been pounding the pavement with a ruck. Um, so I, you know, I did a video on this, but it basically, basically comes down to, to two things is when you have an injury is one, you got to train what is trainable. So, uh, when I had an injury, I always find ways around it. So, and when I had my uh, shoulder surgery, uh, I used the safety squat bar. Um, when I had a nut, like a tore my pec, uh, same thing, safety squat bar. And then I used, um, like the leg press and the hack squat and stuff like that. Um, when I hurt my shoulder, uh, again, like for, you know, when we would, I couldn't do any pressing. So I became the, the Lord of the rowing and chin-ups because I could still do those. So work around with what you have. Um, and if all you're doing right now is, uh, you're walking with a rock man, go ahead and just become the king of that. Because as long as you're doing something and keeping your, your body moving and your body kind of stressed in a good way, we physically stressed, I think you're going to be okay. Um, again, a hand injury sucks, man, because it, it takes, a, it's seems kind of minor cause it's not a back or knee or shoulder, but it will really screw you up. So dude, the other thing is. <clears throat> when you are rucking, it doesn't have to be all the time, but make sure you're still pushing your body and pushing your brain uh, into uncomfortable times so that you never lose that part of your training. Okay. Uh, okay. Here's a question. How to cope with motivation, work ethic problems when working with sports, family, concurrently, any tips or something? Greetings from Poland. Well, greetings from the United States. All right, so you know the the one thing uh, someone said on the forum, I think Kyle said this. Kyle, I think I'm going to quote you. He said uh, we had a guy on the forum uh, have kind of a setback with his rugby training, uh, with his not his training, but for actual rugby, and he's he's got to get back and get back to where he was. And Kyle said something like, congratulations, you now have the gift of purpose. So now his training, what he's doing now is going to mean something because now he's shooting for something that he kind of lost or shooting for a goal. So 
if you need motivation and work ethic, you need some kind of purpose when you train. And it can't be just, you know, there's nothing wrong with, listen, I want to get in shape and I want to get stronger. There's, you got to find a purpose to train, whatever that may be. And even if that purpose is to squat 500 pounds, like you've got to be a thousand percent behind it, you know? And uh, so I think that that's the big thing is you got to have some purpose without purpose. You're just going to wander away. And sometimes that purpose, uh, you know, your purpose might not, you know, be something that, that, that would drive me, uh, but it drives you. And uh, for me, that's like what the weight vest brought back because I felt like I was training with more purpose. Uh, and again, a lot of people kind of got weird about me changing how I trained, but to me, it fueled whatever I wanted to do. Uh, and it brought me back to that, what I call the lizard brain style of training. So you find some purpose with how you train, man. Um, and then magically your motivation will go up. So I can't tell you how many times I went out in that weight and put on that vest and climbed on that bike <clears throat> and my body felt like absolute dog shit, but I never regretted it. I never felt, Oh, uh -huh, maybe I can only do this. I was a thousand percent ready to go, uh, mentally. So find your purpose. All right. We're going to have to, oh, we're doing good here. All right. Uh, Hey Jim, I'm going to have to start cranking through these your strength and conditioning program and forever is good training for the army's PT, pt test okay do you think it's possible to coach soldiers the program with an hour for pt some have no lifting experience uh, it just depends on how many soldiers you got there and depends on how much of equipment uh it would yes i think you can do it an hour a day i mean we've done it with kids uh, so, but again, there, and you may have a hundred people out there. Um, and you know, we may only have 30, 40 or 50. So it just depends on that. And it depends on you as a coach. Um, that's tough though, man. Uh, so yes, I think it can be done. I think the most important thing if I were you was be to teach them how to perform the lifts, uh, and give them loading that they can handle if once they get past the point like they feel comfortable doing the you know whatever lifts that they that you're teaching them so um but yeah that's that's a tough sell man and it's hard too because a lot of those guys probably don't want to do that and that becomes a whole nother thing especially uh when you're <clears throat> you got so many people with so many different backgrounds and so much different different physical abilities so that'd be tough tough to do uh do, 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 do. so youtube vance says uh vincent thank you he says join jim's forum it's an invaluable resource in the great community if jim won't pimp himself i will well thank you vincent uh all right here's a youtube vance thank you vincent uh says i usually see biceps tearing with the deadlift with the alternate grip is there still a risk if i follow the rules of owning each rep and stop as soon as the bar speed decreases Yes, there's always a risk when you lift, guys. It's the way it goes. Yes, you will probably minimize uh, if you use good form. You don't pull the ground, pull the ground, pull the bar off, you know, from the ground using your arms. But there's always going to be risk, guys. You're lifting weights. You're trying to get crazy. It's going to happen. It's going to happen. So you're never going to remove all your risk, guys. And uh, as soon as you do that, you're going to get weaker. Um, okay. Where is it? I'm sorry, guys. I'm going to try and crank through those. Josh Hayes says, I definitely have to join the forum. I assume you can join it from the website. Yes. Uh, Jim, do you do direct arm training? I'm, I'm guessing that's Tim. I hope you're doing well, Tim. Uh, do I or you do my kids? My kids do, yes. Uh, do I? Very rarely will I do some. It's usually like some tricep pushdowns or some curls, but I don't do it very often. I probably should. I'm a big fan of doing tricep pushdowns because I can just throw the band over the, the pull-up rack and just do a bunch of reps and I'm good to go. But I don't do a lot of it. So, uh, Samuel says, doing my first powerlifting meet in March, how do you pick your weight? Uh, well, you pick a goal for that day. And, you know, usually if I were you, I'd probably pick something uh, that is a reasonable goal. And then from there, you work back from your attempts. I know people don't like to hear this, but uh, so if your goal is to uh, 
bench press X, your opener should be about 85% of that goal weight. Uh, the next opener or next opener, your next uh, attempt should be about 92 and a half percent. And then you try your goal thing, but you, you have to learn how to do that because I don't know how to, I'd have to see a train and stuff like that. So you pick a weight that, you know, especially your first meet that might be a just a tad out of, not out of reach, but you know, uh, if you've done 220 for two reps, maybe your goal for the meet would be 225 for a single or something like that. But understand, when you go to a meet, uh, some people, the pressure really gets to them, and some people, uh, you know, explode and just do what I call it, have meat magic. Um, so you pick your weight. You just pick something that you is a challenge but is reasonable. That's the best way I can say it. So uh, you <clears throat> again uh, and then obviously after you uh but i for your first set for your first attempt i'd probably pick something especially on the spot something that you can do for a set of five that's what i would probably do if i were you uh because a lot of things can go bad during the uh opening attempt a lot of things can go bad so pick your five rep max and uh do that for your opener just get in the meat all right no one cares what you open up with so that's the best thing I'd say. And then from there, go up <clears throat> about five, uh, about 5%. And then your, your final set would be 5% over that. So, or five or 10%, somewhere in that range. Uh, okay. Hey, Jim, if someone is pushing their conditioning, increasing their running volume, how do you mentally approach lifting? I know you can't serve two masters and there are only so many hours in the day. How do I mentally approach lifting? Well, if my goal is to increase the conditioning, I just don't really, I still lift. I don't really put a lot of stock and I expect things to go in the dumper, at least for uh, the uh, short, you know, maybe four to six weeks until your body really adapts. So how I approach it, I still do it. I'm still consistent with it, but I understand there's going to be an effect and I'm okay with it. That's the best way to do it. Uh, I always wonder when people say that their goal is to get in better shape and then they freak out <clears throat> about their lifting going down. I don't understand that one bit, zero, because your goal is not to lift the most weight. Your goal, as you said, is to increase your conditioning. So that should only be uh, the only thing that really uh, is center stage to you. So that's how I do it. I let the goal be the goal. Uh Martin says, please help convince me. <laughs> I don't think I can do that. I can still gain strength and muscle, only training twice per week, alternating heavy squat and deadlifts and bench. I can't get past the mental barrier of wanting to do more. Uh, well, I assume that you can only train twice a week, right? I assume that's the, the that that's what you're limited to. Well, I don't know if I can really convince you. I I've done it. You know, lifted twice a week and have made great gains. Other people have done it. I mean, it's happened in the past. So, but I can't sit here and convince you of anything. You're going to have to convince yourself. And I, you know, you're going to have to play. There's some mental gymnastics or just be mentally stronger than what you're showing me right here. So, um, you know, it's been done before and you're just going to have to believe in how you do things and believe in your effort and believe in your attitude. Great things can be done, guys. Uh, if you, if you believe it in your effort and attitude and consistency is on par. So, all right, we're almost done here. All right. The Keystone Outdoorsman says happy Friday. Thank you for the many years of content. Do you have any advice for tradesmen in a physically demanding trade, trying to create progress without creating overuse injuries? So my advice is I wrote an article and I've referenced this many times on these uh, live streams called training for busy or inconsistent men. And I would highly recommend that because it gives you a solid foundation of a program and allows you auto regulate based on your readiness and preparedness for that day. And if you have a very physically demanding job, obviously some days you feel good, some days you feel bad, but I would seriously recommend reading that article and applying those principles because they will work. Um, and, uh, the other thing is you probably need to do less in the weight room than you think uh, because your body still needs to recover. And uh, <clears throat> when you're doing all that stuff outside, you have to account for it uh, in your training. You can't just train like you're 18 anymore, but you can still make progress as long as you're doing it 
within the scope of how <clears throat> how much you can recover. So, okay, Ben or Bean says my deadlift went from three fifteen for one with straps to 365 for five with no straps after doing boring but big for five months. But my bench didn't change at all. I'm still stuck at 185 for three. Yep, that's gonna happen sometimes, man. So uh, as always with the bench press, you're gonna have to build some muscle I, you know, <clears throat> in your upper body. So uh, that's the number one thing I tell the kids. We need to build muscle uh, to get your bench press going somewhere. And that just doesn't include your shoulders and chest. That includes your back, your biceps, your triceps. Uh, and it takes time. That's how it always goes. Uh, the bench and the squat seem to raise pretty quickly, obviously, uh, for beginners. Uh, but because <clears throat> the bench and press have smaller and weaker muscles, um, it's just going to take more time. I always like to say it took me seven years to go from 300 to 400 on the bench press. Now, granted, there were some injuries in there. And I was playing football and all that stuff. So it took me a long time. And then it took me about three months to go from 400 to 455. And it just, everything just kind of caught up and I started, just got stronger. So it, you're going to have to be patient, but make sure you're putting on muscle, make sure you're eating. You should be obviously bigger uh, after doing all that boring, but big, obviously I assume your diet was dead balls on, uh, you know, one pound, of, for every pound of body weight, you're probably eating that much in whole food. So I would keep that up. Assume I think that you're probably already doing that and then build that muscle and not just worry about the bench in your upper body. Increase your pull-up strength, increase your rowing strength, increase your curling strength, increase your dips, increase your push-ups. You gotta have to start to learn other <clears throat> lifts and learn how to raise those so you don't just get so centered on the bench squat and deadlift. Uh, when you do that, it starts becoming very limiting in your training, and then your emotions go up and down and all that stuff. So <clears throat> I always have different lifts uh, that you try to raise, and it doesn't have to be a one rep max. It could be a rep max. It could be like when we do our chin-ups and push-ups and dips, sometimes we have a 10-minute max, or you have uh, 10 minutes of uh, doing chin-ups with the 45-pound plate, stuff like that. So I would look – uh, for other upper body lifts and make sure, you know, to increase those, um, you know, you should be, you know, I assume you're doing push-ups and dips and weighted stuff and weighted chin-ups. Uh, but if you're not, you got to do that. Your row has got to go up. And uh, so increase your worldview of training a little bit. And don't just center on the bench squat and deadlift because it will break your heart, people. I've seen it happen way too many times. All right, last thing. Hey, Jim, hell of a streaming session. Thank you again for carrying the flag. Well, I appreciate it, heavy, heavyweight. Oh, we got one last question. How well did Boyne But Strong work for you? I'm considering giving this a shot once I slow down in deadlifts. But just wanted to see your experience with it. It worked very well for the press and the bench press. I didn't think it didn't work very well for the squat and de deadlift because – for me, I didn't need to do all that work. Um, so that's just been my experience. It may work for you, um, but I have found with the squat and deadlift, uh, the quality of each rep was much more important for me. And so <clears throat> I seem to get a lot out of my training, uh, the bench and dead or squat and deadlift, uh, with just quality, fast, strong reps done with absolute hate and rage every rep. So um, that seemed to work well for me. And then obviously um, training the, the low back, abs, hamstrings, and stuff like that. So um, for me, the main lift was very taxing. Um, I think I put a lot of pressure on myself during those main lifts. And so I, I couldn't really uh, – didn't really respond well with high volume stuff. Cause I was never taught to lift slow everything <clears throat> since, you know, when I learned how to lift was done with control and then explosion control and explosion. And when you lift like that, you got to be a little careful about the volume cause it, it'll wear you out, especially if you're more fast twitch. Um, and that's everyone knows about intra and intramuscular coordination and stuff like that, especially as you get stronger. So didn't work well for me. might work well for you though. I don't know. So, all right. It is 1109. It is time for me to 
go do my little rehab second training session today. I hope everyone has a great weekend. If possible, do something stupid, especially condition-wise, if you have the option to. Uh, I hope everyone spends time this weekend with their friends and family. Uh, remember, guys, Valentine's Day is coming up, so if your wife or girlfriend's weird about that and you have to do something, go get a card today. At least get a card. Um, if your girlfriend or wife doesn't care about that, you're in good hands. You're in a great relationship, and I applaud you. So that's my litmus test for the ladies. Anyway, have a great day, guys. Have a great weekend. Love you all. Thank you. Remember uh, jimwender.com, uh, and remember the, the uh, private forum, which I believe is one of the greatest places on earth. Just kidding. One of the greatest places on the internet for training knowledge. Uh, thank you all for showing up. Have a great day. I'll see you guys next Friday. Bye-bye.